Welcome back to the Missing Maura Murray podcast. Lance, how are you tonight? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? Doing great. This um, this interview is is very fun, I think, for us personally. We got to open up a little bit, and we got to talk to two very smart, brilliant, I dare say, professors from across the pond. Yes, two professors of criminology. They listen to the podcast. They are extremely interested in the case. They have their uh, their classes study elements of the case and elements of other unsolved crimes. Professor David Wilson and Professor Elizabeth Yardley are going to join us in just a little bit for a chat about secondary victims of homicide in newer media, an article that they wrote and published recently. Check the show notes for uh, some links to information about that, although I don't believe their paper is actually viewable online, but we do get into it a little bit. Yeah, their paper is titled, To Me, It's Real Life. And it's on the surface, it seems like it would be a uh, a pretty challenging read. It's about 30 pages, uh, probably about 28 pages once you get past the, uh, the notes and... Um, the references. Once you start reading it, it really feels familiar and almost like a instruction manual for those who contribute to true crime online. What I mean is it shows you the cause and effect and the the effect and the reaction of, of what people say and how it comes back to people who are close to that particular case. We cover a broad range of topics, including our relationship to the Mari family, the ethics of doing a podcast like this, armchair detectives in general, um, people injecting themselves into uh, this story and other stories, missing white woman syndrome, which is very interesting, and of course their personal theories at the end of the episode. Yeah, and the thing that really struck me was as I was reading it, so many things about it, so many elements of this paper were so familiar and so applicable to what we're doing, and I didn't realize it was going to be, you know, when we first asked them uh, if they wanted to be on, they sent us the paper. I was I was a little nervous about what we were going to talk about and how it was going to be relevant to this case. But once I read it and once you hear the interview, you realize it's extremely relevant to this case and it's relevant to all unsolved crime. It's relevant to, to all online crime. Um, and you really understand, and I think it's important with this case and with anybody who contributes to perhaps solving a, a, a mystery and using the online platform to do so. It's really you, you really should should think about who you are, like where what you're doing, and what what category you fit into, because you fit into a category that's brand new. They bring up the new media aspect, newer media, newer media aspect of everything, and you realize what movement you're a part of, and it's a brand new movement, and it's a really revolutionary movement, and it's not anything that's going to go away because, I mean, the internet's not going to go away. And people's interest, uh, their fascination in true crime is not going to go away. And uh, I think it's really important to understand what your roots are and what your foundation is, and you're a part of something that is, uh, that's, that's new in the landscape of this whole platform. Okay, but before we roll that very interesting interview, we want to mention the UMass Outing Club, the uh, the track cabin in Bethlehem, New Hampshire, in the White Mountains that was in the news recently because uh, 12 UMass athletes, students, went to Bethlehem, and uh, one of them had a bad reaction to LSD. So they basically all got in trouble because they tried to get this uh, one person help. And it is a little bit of insight into what goes on at this cabin. But more than that, it sort of sparked a lot of um, debate online recently. Yeah, it did. And there's been a lot of uh, behind the scenes activity going on for a while now involving this cabin. And it's uh, it hasn't reached nearly the level of, say, the the red truck or the rag in the tailpipe or, um, you know, Rick Forcier's sighting of what could be Mora. Those are all the very apparent elements of 
our discussions when uh, when we're talking about the case. This has always kind of been on the peripheral of 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 those discussions. I don't think we've ever mentioned it on air other than maybe fielding some questions on it. I don't remember having any really in-depth conversations about it, and there's a reason for that, and we're going to get into that that reason momentarily. While the idea of this UMass cabin uh, is new to a lot of people online, this is actually something that we knew about months ago. And uh, John Smith actually knew about it back in 2004. So this is something that was investigated in the past. And furthermore, we actually asked uh, law enforcement a question about this. So the question was, and it was uh, the 41st question that we asked them, This question relates to an outing club owned by UMass that's located in Bethlehem, New Hampshire. Has there ever been any indication that this may have been Mora's ultimate destination? Their answer is, no information slash evidence collected indicates that she was headed for Bethlehem or for an outing club. We did have a conversation that resulted in us agreeing to omit this question. And I think the reason was, and help me if I'm wrong here, Lance, was more because we were afraid that the online community was really going to, I don't know if act on this is the right word, but really uh, let this one get away with them. Because ultimately, police's answer is that there was no evidence or information collected that indicates. So they don't think that Mora was headed there at this time. So that means nothing in her car, nothing that anybody said to them would suggest that there was anything going on at that cabin this night. Um, So you can run with that if you want, but keep in mind that the authorities are not looking at it right now. And we know how our listeners and how people involved in this case from a distance will feverishly and passionately look into different elements of, of the, uh, of the case. And we're not saying that we believe that she was or was not going to this cabin. We're just saying it's, it's such a, it could be possible that she was headed there. I don't think we want to say that it's not, we looked at this and you can look at the map yourself and it, could be possible that she was heading there. But the fact still remains that there is no evidence to suggest that that was the case. And Tim and I try to approach everything with the understanding that what we what we put out there could possibly have an effect on the case. So I feel like this was one of the questions that we rolled around for a little while and we decided, hey, it the way it was answered, we didn't want to put it out there and have any part of the investigation be compromised in any way by any false information that might come forward. We wanted to, to wait for the, for the right time. We've seen things about this case, and we've seen instances come, come forward and theories come forward and, and, and what could possibly be a break come forward. And it's turned out that it hasn't been accurate. And in the meantime, people who were involved with whatever piece of information came forward that might have been a break, they're now involved in this case, and it 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 really affects their lives. So Tim and I always try to approach this in a in a you know we try to be as responsible as possible. And if there is something that is answered by law enforcement, where you know we finally got law enforcement to answer some questions their answers we want to make sure we put out there in the most responsible way possible. So this was one of those questions that we thought, hey, this might be something that that they have more information on. This this might this is a plausible theory as to her destination and if they haven't if they don't have any information, they don't have any evidence that was collected. Something about that strikes me as maybe they're still looking into it and they're still collecting information or they're still collecting evidence. And it, it's just, it's something that we didn't want to compromise the investigation by by giving an answer and having people run with it. And also the problem with it is that you can take it a bunch of different ways too. It doesn't rule out anything. It doesn't, you know, you can look at it and say, oh, well, that means she didn't get there. And that means she was probably abducted. Or that means, uh, oh, she had a destination that night. That means some one of her friends picked her up and they went there and partied that night. 
Well, we can't tell you yes or no to either of those. All we can tell you is what the police said, law enforcement said. No information slash evidence collected indicates that she was headed for Bethlehem or for an outing club. Don't take this information and start contacting people on your own. Or just being convinced of it as being the truth. Right. Take it for what it is. It's pretty relevant right now going into this interview that we're that we did with the uh, with the the uh, professors of criminology. A random occurrence happened where a UMass student had a bad reaction to LSD. Therefore, that becomes something relevant with this case because it's UMass and it was a cabin in the in in that area. So. Obviously, you know, one plus one equals more was headed there. And she told friends and they were all going to party there. But if law enforcement tells us that's not the case, we it's frustrating, but we might have to just say, OK, well, yeah, it would have been a really convenient connect the dots moment. But it probably isn't because law enforcement has told us that it's not. And they found no evidence of her being there. And they found no evidence of her being there. Right. Right. This shows you how that that new media element, that newer media element, and that uh, the 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 armchair detective culture, you need to be a little you 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 have to be more selective, vet it, you know, vet it out and make sure that it's it's not a lead or it is a lead, but don't come out and assume that you have the authority to determine something that law enforcement has dismissed. Because it's new to you. Okay, well said, Lance. And uh, let's roll the interview with Professor David Wilson and Professor Elizabeth Yardley. Welcome to the podcast, uh, Professor David Wilson and Professor Elizabeth Yardley, professors of criminology from the UK. How are you doing this Friday night? Well, I'm very well. And even though it's half past eight and there's rugby on the television, I'm excited to be talking to you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, me too. It um, it, it makes sure that I'm not making dinner. (laughs) (laughs) I get to put that off for a little bit longer. So that's good. We'll try to um, make it as interesting as possible for you. Uh, Again, thank you for coming on. Um, And we'll, uh, I don't know, you can maybe DVR the the rugby game match. Is it a match? It's a match. It's live paused at the moment. It's um, Harlequins, which are, who are based in London, playing against Montpellier, a French side. But I've I've live paused it because this is far more important. Okay. I think I have uh, have money on uh, the Harlequins. So go, go Harlequins. (laughs) <laughs> well welcome to the show we wanted to have you on you guys wrote a paper um a very interesting article uh it's called to me it's real life secondary victims of homicide in newer media and uh, it it is about the reddit page from the serial case the uh hey Min lee case of course on um, the one that serial covered on season one and it's about the brother of well actually you guys tell you guys tell tell us what it's about i i wouldn't do it justice yeah sure well, basically we got we were really interested in serial weren't we so so we were kind of following um the podcast and following what was happening around the podcast online and we came across the serial subreddit and i'm, I'm quite interested in reddit and i follow quite a, a few different subreddits various different things and I noticed the serial subreddit kind of pop up and there was an awful lot of activity on there. Um, so I just started seeing what were people saying on there, what kind of things were they talking about? And it soon became quite obvious that it wasn't just kind of fans of, of the podcast that were on there discussing it. There were also people who who were or claimed to be connected to the case itself. So I thought that was a really interesting concept. So you've got these kind of fans of, of infotainment, you know, this this idea that that true crime can also you know cross over into the entertainment realm you've got them coming into the same environment as people who've been personally affected 
by the homicide that that, that true crime representation you know is is part of and and I thought I'd, I just want to kind of have a bit more of a look at this and see what's what's going on and I think for me uh, Elizabeth has kind of prompted me to start looking more closely at social media and how social media is changing the entire context in which crime can be investigated, crime can be announced, crime can be committed. And it was that sense of moving into living in media as opposed to living with media that began to intrigue both of us. And so it was based on uh, the materials that we wrote uh, um, that we wrote about Serial, to me it's real life, were based on earlier research that Elizabeth and I had uh, conducted about Facebook murder. We were intrigued by how murderers were using Facebook and it was that journey from mm. Facebook murder into thinking about podcasting and serial that really led us both into your incredible uh, podcast about missing Maura Murray. Uh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, and and that's really interesting. Your journey to find uh, to to write this paper, and uh, it is a fascinating subject and uh, very well. It made me feel smarter just reading it. Just holding it makes me feel smarter. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say so. Thank you. <laughs> no, and and I just wanted to say thank you for uh, bringing this to us. Um, I'm not going to lie. When I printed it up and saw the 33 pages, I was uh, I started to sweat a little bit. I was a little daunted um, and uh, almost uh, you know afraid that I was going to start reading it and and <laughs> and going. I don't get this at all. Um, <laughs> um, I'm the queen a- of the lengthy paper, and David will tell you if there's something I can say in two paragraphs that could be summed up in a sentence, I'll say it in two paragraphs. <laughs> yeah, and but that's even that is. Um, the length, once once I sat down and committed myself to, okay, I'm going to take this time and read this, um, my brain just like ate it up. I was highlighting stuff. It's really, really, um, it's really user friendly. It's really uh, relatable because you have, um, and you even touch on, touch on the, um, that, that, that concept, you know, uh, Serial was focusing on. Uh, late teens, 18 year olds, uh, 19 year olds. So the podcast community is in that age range and they can relate to it. Um, we're doing the, we're doing a podcast about a, um, you know, about a similar kind of, you know, about a mystery. Um, so it was really relatable to me. And, uh, you had a really great line here in, uh, right in the beginning. It's something that I, um, something that I highlighted, uh, the difference between something like this american life and serial the podcast the the reason why people you know sort of sort of ate it up was because uh it was a quote here because a podcast seems like a better place for a long story that you need to hear from the beginning um i just thought that was i thought that was uh, that was one of the first things that stood out to me um and something that i didn't understand going into doing our podcast about mora uh, that it's something, it's a long story, and it's something that people can now reference at different points if they um, if they want to know certain facts about it. And I well, think, I think audiences are getting uh, much more sophisticated in terms of what they're demanding from from media now. So there's a real appetite for those lengthy, complex narratives. People want to understand cases and stories inside out from various different perspectives. Uh, talking to various different experts rather than having a kind of neatly packaged half hour program or, or hour program. I think there's a real kind of commitment to to really kind of lose themselves in, in cases now. And we saw that with the, the jinx on um, on HBO and, and other other types of, of thing like that. So people really want to get in and understand, you know, try and get inside the mind of people who are, who are involved in, in these mysteries. I think Elizabeth's touching on something that... Uh, both of us um, feel very passionately about because both of us appear regularly on British television talking about crime. And we kept pushing producers and directors and commissioners to say, you know, look, actually, I think a lot of the public understand the things that you understand the answers to the questions that you're posing to us. We want to take you to the next level. And the next level was both about a complexity in relation to the issues that were being presented in black and white. There was a great deal of gray in the issues that were being presented. But also there was a sense, and it seems to me that you guys capture this, 
that there was an unfolding drama to what was being presented, as opposed to things which were cut and dried and neatly packaged within, uh, within you know, one episode. And that's why the podcast, it seemed to me, to be such a, a mechanism to be able to explore different narratives, competing narratives, and allow the public to judge for themselves, as opposed to having a judgment imposed upon them. And now when anybody asks me why we think that this podcast can have, you know, as many episodes as possible, I'm just going to play that clip. <laughs> <laughs> I will never be able to say it like that. <laughs> that's, that's so kind. For, for us, Serial and the Jinx were game changers. Elizabeth and I appear. Elizabeth's doing uh, Born to Kill in the United States. I'm doing Interview with a Murderer for Channel 4 at the moment. And both of us have used the kind of context that you guys have set out to be able to say to producers, directors, uh, look, you've got to take this further. If you are simply presenting this in the way that they present things on, say, something which is completely fictional, like CSI, then the, you're dumbing it down so much that you're not allowing the audience any agency in relation to how they will interpret what, what it is, the knowledge that we've got the, about particular types of crimes. So how did you guys come across um, our podcast? Well, I'm, I was a real fan of Serial, and, and after Serial finished, I, I was getting kind of serial withdrawal symptoms, so I was having a, a look around for, for something else that, that really kind of got into an individual case. So I, I subscribe to, to other podcasts like Sword and Scale and, and those types of things, but they just tend to look at one case per episode, and I just wanted to get into something else. And I also needed something to accompany me on uh, the runs that I do, because I'm quite a keen runner. And I don't like running to music. I like running to to, to, to stories, essentially. Um, so I, I was having a look around on, on iTunes. And then I think Crime Writers on Serial, their podcast recommended Maura Murray. And they were talking about the, the case and, and your podcast. I thought, I'm going to give that a go. And um, I went on some incredibly lengthy runs <laughs> to be able to listen to some of the episodes. So, uh, so yeah, that's how I got started with it. Very and cool. it was Elizabeth that then convinced me that I should, I don't go on lengthy l runs, but lengthy walks. And it was Elizabeth that convinced me that there was something here that was interesting. I, 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 I must say, I was slightly skeptical initially because I said, oh, is this just part of missing white woman syndrome that I'm going to hear a story about classically the kinds of stories that will emerge and be given purchase and uh, some kind of platform in traditional media, albeit this is a podcast. Uh, but the more I kind of saw the layers that were being built up and the way that I felt that the narrative was unfolding uh, hooked me in because I felt you were prepared to take uh, risks throughout the podcast. I mean, for example, um, I must be asked every single week by a TV producer if I would be prepared um, to work with um, a clairvoyant. Uh, a sensing murder kind of idea. And I've always said no, because I see that as so um, repellent. And yet you were prepared to use the podcast to actually have a kind of an alternative voice to see if that could, um, if that could throw some light onto the subject. And I thought you did it incredibly well, even if I distrusted what it was that the, your clairvoyant was saying to you, and both of you engaged later in a really reflective way about how she might have been able to have said some of the things that she said to you. And I thought that was actually incredibly brave of you both to be able to do so. Well, thanks a lot. Yeah, it's um, as we were talking about right before we started rolling. Uh, this this podcast it definitely is is now nowhere near where me and Lance expected it to be. In fact, I don't even think we expect, or I don't even know what we expected when we first started this. I mean, we're not journalists. We didn't we didn't go to journalism school. We we know how to tell stories, but we didn't really write it out. We didn't script it out. We did it in real time. Um, just seeing where it took us and, and going uh, episode by episode. And I wonder, 
Elizabeth and I, when we talk about, uh, when we reflect on what we've listened to, some of the things that we would like to ask of you relate to some of the ethical issues that must have cropped up for you as a consequence of not having gone to journalism school and therefore not understanding necessarily, I, I, I don't know if this is true, but it, not necessarily understanding the libel or the slander laws, which would really constrain a, a filmmaker in a traditional sense. I wondered what sort of ethical uh, layers uh, that you had put in for yourselves and if there were some challenges along the way ethically that you felt that you could not uh, overcome and therefore had to drop in terms of what you were prepared to uh, broadcast? It was a challenge figuring out what we can talk about, what we should or shouldn't talk about, um, with it being uh, still an, an open investigation. That's one thing. Um, also trying to sift through all of the the rhetoric, I guess would be the word to use, uh, that that comes along with this case, that comes along with the blogs and the commenters and everybody, the Reddits, uh, you know, the, the Reddit contributors. Um, and, you know, we just, there's so many theories out there. Uh, Tim and I really in the beginning, we still do, um, and it's more instinctive now, but in the beginning, we probably after the third or third or fourth episode, we really started making a, a focused effort to figure out how to deliver information and not, and not pin any one theory down uh, and not you know, properly vet everything, properly vet everything and, and everyone and, uh, and, and give, the, give enough information so the listeners can can put the pieces together on their own and maybe something new can come of that. That's yeah, it's very always challenging, isn't it, in terms of ethics? And, and we, we find that as well in our work because as academics, if we want to do an official piece of research, it ha has to go through an ethics committee at the university. And, and invariably, these, these committees include people who aren't criminologists. Um, so they're people from, from different disciplines within our faculty. So they're people from business and they're people from law. And, and sometimes it's quite difficult to, to get, you know, approval for, for the types of, of things that we do. So, so it's, um, it's a real minefield at times, isn't it? And what interests us both is that, of course, for us, the two greatest uh, social experiments in social psychology were the Stanford prison experiment and the uh, Milgram's obedience to authority experiments. Mm. Uh, so Zimbardo and Milgram, and neither Zimbardo or Milgram uh, would have had ethical approval. And neither of those experiments, if they were being, uh, if they had to go through an ethics committee within the academy today, would ever have been given approval. And so it seems to me very interesting that you're at the cutting edge of trying to work out for yourselves, well, wait a minute, what, what, what do we think just on a common sense level here we can say and those things that actually we shouldn't be saying because this is still an open case. Very, very interesting. Yeah, it really is. Um, it's it's that. And, and as we get into it, we see that we do have a lot of listeners who bring forward very reasonable theories. And we have people who are close to the case communicating to us. Uh, and some things do make sense and th some things don't make any sense. But we see that there can be, and maybe we are on the – on the on the edge of figuring something out, but we see that there can be a way to make this investigation come together with the information that we provide. So it's also like accepting that responsibility. When we first got involved in starting this, we definitely had no idea any about any libel laws or slander laws or anything like that. We didn't really. I, I feel like we were kind of like uh, chickens with our heads cut off a little bit, like running around just just talking. We, we, we were just talking. And uh, seeing what happened, and uh, and then we pretty much started focusing, refocusing every uh, maybe group or batch of episodes that we did. And I remember at one point um, uh, we were really like, it, maybe we we're seven, ten episodes in. I'm not really sure, but we were like, well, how, how the hell are we still doing this about <laughs> the Murray family? And we've never even spoken to the Murrays. Mm. And, and it was kind of like, kind of dawned on us. And I felt really awful about it actually, because it's like, you know, we, we've said some, 
some really questionable things. We've put the focus on Fred at times because we went into this blind saying we're going to look at everything. And, well, Fred and the, the Murray connection we had to look at as well. And uh, that was that was a really interesting moment. And I think that was the point where we said, well, at least we can try to give Fred what he wanted 12 years ago, which was for the FBI to take over this case. And so we worked with John in setting up the petition. We figured we could get um, several thousand signatures and that could maybe uh, elicit some some further involvement from the FBI. Um, and it didn't or hasn't yet, but at least it got a response, which uh, was kind of surreal in general, just reading that. And yeah. is that the journey that you guys have been on? Because initially, my interpretation, I, I won't at, at all speak for Elizabeth, but my interpretation is that the journey that you've been on is that you were firstly interested in the phenomenon. Why, why this case? Why this phenomenon? Why this particular girl? And then gradually, as you've gone on that journey, you're not just giving uh, voice to an interest about the case generically, you know, why this case, why does it have purchase, that you've become incredibly and centrally involved in the investigation of, 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 her, of her going missing. And that leads into some of the things that Elizabeth and I have been trying to write academically about, about this phenomenon of the armchair detective. And it seems to me would this be fair i don't want to i don't want to uh, i don't want to uh, paint you with this if you think it's wrong but that you have become the armchair detectives that you were initially interested in simply discussing that that's absolutely uh accurate and uh it's it was sort of i i guess after realizing it it's it's strange um and was not intentional um but in looking back it was inevitable i guess yeah, it's interesting because as, as social scientists, um, there are there are quite a few criminologists and sociologists who who do a particular type of research called ethnography, and that essentially means that they go and hang around with the groups that they they study. They they spend time with them. They kind of immerse themselves in in their lives and their realities. And and one of the the terms that always pops up in relation to ethnography is is going native. And that means basically becoming one of the, the group that, that you're studying. And, and several of our colleagues, I think, have over the years who've done that kind of research have found themselves, you know, on teetering on the edge sometimes and, and other times, you know, diving right in. And it's difficult to to kind of say this is something I'm investigating and, and then this is something I'm actually part of. But I think our view uh, in terms of the, the type of criminology we do is that sometimes you have to be part of it to understand it. You can't stand back and be an objective observer because in order to, to access the, the meanings and the realities, you've got to kind of hang around with people and spend time with them and, and really kind of get into to their environment and their, their reality. And that for me is... Where, where, we, where you have hit this kind of zeitgeist, because it seems to me that traditional law enforcement, uh, criminologists um, working in universities, um, really haven't gained, uh, really haven't understood how to harness the power of the development of social media. For for us, it seems to me that for us, it seems to us, I beg your pardon, that there is something going on here that is incredibly useful for law enforcement. If only law enforcement really understood how to use it better. And in a sense, therefore, you're at this first wave about how to tell the stories, but then gradually you become part of that community that's trying to investigate. And it's the investigatory power or the investigatory potential that really is something that is incredibly open and for law enforcement to try and pick up upon. Now, is that an example of the remediation that you write about in your paper? Yes, I think so. Because um, when we talk about the idea of remediation, we're saying that there isn't a, a real stark dividing line between old media and new media, but they, they shape and they fashion each other. So if you think about newspapers now, um, it, it's not just, you know, we've moved from newspapers to something else, but, but newspapers have got um, um, online forms um, and online comment sections. So, so we can't, we participate in media now rather than just consume it. 
And I think that's that's something that the criminologists are still kind of struggling to get their heads around and, and the same for law enforcement as well. I think I'm very comfortable about saying, Lance and Tim, that Elizabeth and I, when we ask our first year criminology students, and we'll have a, a 400 students in the lecture theatre in the very first week, we'll ask them to put up their hands if any of them have read a traditional newspaper in the preceding month. <laughs> and if 5% say, if 5% put up their hands, we're now rather shocked. They will not consume newspapers. They will not buy into news in any of the traditional ways that my generation uh, would uh, consume news. They are now online entirely. And therefore, if you think about that as a phenomenon, we've got to, criminologists, academics, others, they've got to acknowledge that phenomenon and work out, therefore, why would young, what, how could they get information to young people about uh, crime, about uh, that they, they, young people might be able to offer information in terms of their knowledge of crimes that have been con uh, committed? Well, how does a traditional law enforcement agency access that group of people who can potentially tell them things? And of late, what Elizabeth and I have been very keen to discuss is the future of murder and how the, the whole context in which murder is going to happen and that murderers and how murderers will behave is absolutely changing as a consequence of people now living in as opposed to living with media. We need to stop kind of thinking about people who contribute to these types of forums and that, that kind of thing as just one homogeneous mass. I think we've got lots of different types of people who get involved in, in Reddit forums and, and add comments and, and those types of things. Because I think in the early days of the internet, I think one of the biggest concerns that, that people had was around anonymity. Um, so people not identifying who they are on on particular sites and particular forums. And we've started to see that's that's kind of shifted and changed a bit, whereas we look at Reddit and people are able to conceal their identities quite well on there. But then when we look at a platform like Facebook, um, there's not so much of that that goes on because we use that in a slightly different way. So when we're on Facebook, we're, we're basically using that to maintain our existing relationships that we have with people face to face. Um, but but on forums like Reddit, you know, often these are people who who don't know each other offline. So you you find that the behaviour is quite different from from one to the other. And um, one of the things that we've been very interesting uh, interested to pursue is how online and offline behaviour might overlap or mirror. And um, of course, one of the things that criminologists always do is that we love developing typologies. And so you're, you were coming up there with a typology, a classic, a classic way, a stereotype about how people online, what, what they will be like. But when Elizabeth and I, for example, conducted the research about how people were using Facebook in the commission of or after the event of a murder, we found a variety of different ways that people use Facebook. For example, there would be some Facebook murderers who would use who would use Facebook to inform people. They were informers. They wanted to say they had they had committed the murder and they wanted to gain the maximum amount of publicity by being able to inform as many people as possible through using Facebook. But equally, we had people who were reactors on Facebook. They would react. They would use the. The, the fact that, a stat, for example, classically, somebody had changed their status from married to single or in a relationship, and they would react to that change of status. And that was that reaction that prompted them to want to take the life of the person who had changed their status. So, and, and we went on and added other types to mm. the, the various people that we uncovered. But our, my point is more... It is to return to what you were asking about, the idea that there's a stereotypical picture of one kind of person using social media is completely and utterly, it seems to me, outdated and needs to change. 
from my personal uh, perspective using Reddit and using uh, there, there's a uh, Facebook podcast discussion group about this podcast. And uh, to your point, um, a lot of people on the Facebook page, very nice. Uh, haven't really gotten any mean comments about uh, me or about the podcast. Uh, but then if you go to the uh, the Reddit page about this podcast, it's it's almost all um, negative comments about us and about the podcast and about what we've done, the work we've done in this case. And maybe it's because of the anonymity, um, yeah. the, the nature of Reddit or, or what, but... There is, there, there's actually um, some academic research into to this idea of, of, of what anonymity kind of enables people to do. And it goes back to 2004. It was um, a piece of research that, that came up with the term toxic online disinhibition. So this is the idea that, that when you're online and when your identity is concealed, you're going to be much more vicious and nasty towards people than, than if you're you know, in, in a forum where, where everybody knows who you are. So it is hiding behind that anonymity, I think, does enable, you know, the, the worst in some people to come out. Both Elizabeth and I are on Twitter and um, it's always interesting. We compare uh, those people that will be mean to us on Twitter. And I think that, again, that online disinhibition effect, Elizabeth gets far more um trolling than i do because i think also there's a gender issue there as well that that people tend to be far meaner online to women than they would be to men there's a sense in which they seem to target uh women in particular as opposed to uh, men there does seem to be a sense in which you know i i tend to get <clears throat> i tend to get different types of <clears throat> stalking going on online as opposed to rather I, I i usually get a cruel comment and then that will move away that will move on uh, that doesn't necessarily happen all the time in terms of uh, the gender split another thing about your uh, your paper that stood out to me uh, and was extremely interesting was the wound culture um can you can you talk about that just for uh, just for a little bit well, it's, it's this idea that, that we're, we're so fascinated with, with murder and trauma and, and other kind of terrible things that, that happen in the world. And, and I think Mark Seltz is also, um, he's the person who came up with that, that idea of wound culture. And um, he's also described it as a theatre for the living and the murder leisure industry. And, and, and we are so fascinated with, with awful crimes. And it, it's interesting because it's completely disproportionate. If you look at the majority of, of police recorded crime, it's property crime, it's burglary, it's theft, it's, it's things like that, it's drugs offences. And, and when you look at, at homicide, that's actually a very small proportion of, of all the crimes that happen. But we are, you know, utterly fascinated with it. There's, there's that old saying, you know, by newspaper editors, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, and I think that's, that's still very much true. True for, for for all types of media today, and uh, psychologically, we tend to call uh, that co-activation. So that the person consuming this wound culture is both fearful of it; uh, they're scared um, because clearly the, there is a death, there's trauma as a consequence of what it is that they're consuming, because they're consuming somebody's, uh, somebody's life has been taken. But at the same time that there's fear about that, there's excitement, it's co-activation. They're excited in the same way. That kind of co-activation is easier to describe if you think about taking a ride on a big dipper, whereby you are screaming, but at the same time you're rather enjoying the ride, the thrill of the ride, the speed of the ride. And so the wound culture taps into that sense whereby um, psychologically, we have both these dissonant fears, but happening at the same time, that there's that desperation to look away, but at the same time, not to look away. The line that kind of gave me the chills a little bit was uh, on the autopsy table, uh, pornography and forensics meet and fuse. In a wound culture, the spectacle of a torn and open body is the relay point of private fantasy and public space. And that private fantasy and public space is, uh, I don't know, it just kind of sucked me in. It just I, I, I read that and everything about what we're doing with this podcast and everything about the people that contact us, it just I mean, it, that that just defined it for me. In this country, in England, uh, Elizabeth and I are best known for our work in relation to serial murder. Now, clearly, we're, we're in a different type of crime 
in relation to missing Maura Murray. But there is that incredible fascination with extreme violence and and the potential for extreme violence because ultimately what we're tapping into is a mystery and people love a who done it or a what happened because of course mysteries are riven deep into the evolutionary cycle of human beings, because ultimately we have to unravel those mysteries as a way of surviving. And so I think there is something about engaging with this material, which our ancestors would have engaged in different materials, but as a way of trying to make sense of the world that they were in. And without making it trying to, uh, without going into too many kind of uh, um, French philosophy what we're dealing with here is that sense of you know how do we how do we make sense of ourselves at this point in time yeah I very much agree with that and I think when we're looking at stories like the the Moore Murray disappearance it's it's that sense of legend and that sense of folklore that that's going on as well so it I think the appeal in in her story in particular is that it carries a message or, or a belief or, or a lesson um, about, I think, yeah, in terms of young women's behaviour, um, what's expected of them, you know, when they begin to deviate from the mainstream and, and all of those those types of things. So, you know, look what can happen if you bend the rules and you don't behave as expected. It, it's all of those those types of things that, that have been appealing to people for, for centuries. And I think this is just one of the, the latest manifestations of that. And therefore, yeah. there's that there's that historic sense in which women who transgress are doubly deviant. Not only have they transgressed in terms of the law, and obviously the earlier podcast brought out the fact that uh, Maura had been caught, we call it drunk driving, or I, I think you call it driving under the influence. She may have stolen something. She did steal something at West Point. So she was deviant in the sense that she had broken the law, and therefore she was doubly deviant because she had broken a stereotype about how women, what was appropriate for women to do and how they should behave. That's great. I I had a question from uh, something that Liz had said, but you just answered it. So awesome. Can I say one of the episodes that really intrigued me because we're back to the sense of fascination and where are we now as a culture? As, uh, and I regard North American culture as, and, and European culture, Northern European culture, as very similar. Where are we now? And there's this incredible fascination with psychopathy. And one of the episodes that really intrigued me was when you had I- interviewed uh, Professor Robert Eckstein. And it, it seemed to me that uh, that tapped into the sense of was she a psychopath? And I find that really fascinating at the moment. You know, why do so many people believe in, uh, why do so many people believe that they can identify psychopathy? And for me, it goes back to one of my bugbears. One of the things that my pet hates is the John Ronson book, um, The Psychopath Test, where so many people think they understand psychopathy and imply that that person is behaving because they're because they've got psychopathic traits, and yet they do not understand that uh, construct, that personality disorder at all. They have a really stereotypical view about what about what psychopathy is, almost in the same way that you were presenting in terms of saying most people would think that somebody using Reddit would be doing so late at night, have long hair in a darkened room. That for me was one of the most interesting episodes because I thought we were trying to really try and expand our understanding of what psychopathy actually was. And I think it's it was the the, the willingness I think of some people to to label Mora as a psychopath as a sociopath. It, it almost um, we need an explanation for her behaviour, and I think we've we found this when we've been trying to explain women's criminal or women's deviant behaviour for for hundreds of years. We're we're very quick to point to kind of biological faults with them. 
um, rather than, you know, anything sociological or, or anything cultural. You know, they're, they're damaged and, and they're wrong and, and that's, that explains it all. Um, but we've moved on, I think, so, so much further than the kind of biological um, criminology and some of the things that, that we look at now in terms of, uh, of what we expect of, of women's behaviour, what we expect of, of men and, and different ethnicities and different age groups. So I think I think it's getting much more sophisticated in terms of explaining why people behave in the way that they do. But I think in recent years, we've seen a bit of a pull back towards that biological determinism, which is, is what we call it, in terms of, well, psychopaths are born, um, they can't help it. Um, they, they do these things because they're kind of hardwired and programmed. But but we think that psychopathy, it's, it's a combination of nature and nurture. So there will be people who are who are born with a, a tendency to be more aggressive, for example. But the, the, the extent to which that will come out and that how that will manifest itself is heavily dependent upon the type of family they grow up in, the type of community they grow up in, the type of values that, that surround them. So so I found that psychopathy discussion really interesting because it it does kind of pull us right back to those those biological things. Well, this this conversation begs the question: uh, What do you think? Do you think Mora was a sociopath, or is any any way uh, she was a psychopath? Absolutely not. Um, I think that she was clearly having some difficulties in the um, months preceding her disappearance. But to label her um, psychopathic as a consequence of those difficulties, seem to me to be missing the point entirely. I've worked all my adult career with uh, violent psychopaths, and um, nothing that I've heard uh, over the course of the podcast and in terms of any of the reading that I've done about Maura Murray would suggest that psychopathy was an issue for her. What about um, any of the uh, guests that we've had on the podcast or uh, or any of the people that we've mentioned? <laughs> yes, I feel there were a number that one could think there were some difficulties, but I do know the laws of slander and uh... we're trying to get you arrested. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't apply in America. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I think this is this is what's so good about your podcast, though, is that you've been so open to all of these different voices, and it's given the audience a chance to to listen to people. You've given people a platform, and they they've had that platform, and they've had their say, and then people are able to make up their own minds. You've not censored anybody or prevented anyone from being heard. I think you've you've opened it up as widely as as possible, and I think that's that's only been to the benefit of of your podcast. Thank you. Yes, I, in, until we had to pull one of the episodes. Episodes. I, w- I would agree. <laughs> Maybe we opened it up a bit too wide, so we closed it a little bit. <laughs> um, the intentions are good. Some things you just can't control, and uh, and and it just turns into uh, doing doing more harm than than good. But there is a phenomenon going on there that um, that we we Liz and I haven't been able to write about yet, but we will try and get uh, around to it at some stage, whereby every single day. Every single day, uh, I, I'm, I'm genuinely not exaggerating. I will get an email or a letter from a member of the public in this country who will claim to me that they ha- that uh, a well-known paedophile called Robert Black, who's dead, uh, had tried to abduct them uh, when they were growing up. It, it, it's almost as if... Um, there is some meaning given to their life by claiming that uh, this dreadful man who did abduct children, rape and kill them, had attempted to abduct them in their childhood. And it seems to me, therefore, there is this sense in which, and we're back to that idea of uh, Seltzer's wound culture, that people are relating to this kind of trauma, that they want to be connected to this kind of trauma, because it's this kind of trauma and their relationship to it, which makes them, but bizarrely, ironically, feel alive, feel special, feel different, feel connected, feeling part of our culture. And isn't that incredibly sad? But nonetheless, and Elizabeth is right, 
what the podcast has done, what you've allowed people to do is to feel connected, even if some of them um, have been connected in ways which, whereby you felt, my gosh, you just need help. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that we totally meant to do all that. <laughs> whatever you just said <laughs> I totally meant it <laughs> one part that I highlighted in uh, in your paper was your talk about secondary victims and I found this very interesting and uh, it, here here's a part uh, it, it is argued that the death of their relative becomes a media event secondary victims lose ownership over their loss I thought that was really interesting, and it it um, sort of made me sad. And and I guess we we must agree with that. Although I don't know if I really do in all cases, but I mean we we did a podcast about about this, so yeah, we we took it away from the Murrays in a, in a certain way. Um, but yeah, the, I I found the secondary victims um, losing ownership over this to be an interesting subject. Yeah, and I think that's that's even more relevant today now that we're we're in the age of new media and you know Facebook and Reddit and Twitter and around the the, the Heyman Lee uh, case we saw people setting up um, you know the the Woodlaw scholarship fund and people kind of grieving these individuals that they never knew um, in in life but they 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 kind of feel a connection to because. Um, the information about their their, their death is, is so readily available and they're, they're so kind of into these cases that they almost feel that they're they're a part of it and and I think that you know it's, it's in one way I think the the secondary victims the families and and, and, and relatives of of people you know who've been the victim of homicide are sometimes you know quite quite pleased that their their loved one is is getting that 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 attention and and that they're being you know validated in that way and and recognized and remembered but i think at the same time it, it can be quite intrusive um for people because this was their friend it was their relative and now yeah everybody else is kind of you know wanting a piece of them well of course ultimately it's about control and so uh, people, you know, you you when you engage either the old or the new media, you've got a tiger by the tail, and when you've a tiger by the tra the tail, you can't control it. And so sometimes the secondary victimization is it, it is as a consequence of you feeling that you can't make the narrative go in a particular direction in which you would rather choose it to go in. I mean, uh, Elizabeth and I have just supervised a PhD student called Harriet Tolpat, who looked at how the, the surviving family members of serial killers um, um, uh, coped with the fact that they had had a loved one kill by, killed by a high-profile British serial killer. And actually what she uncovered, Harriet Tolpa uncovered, was that the families of the victims were desperate for media attention, were desperate to keep the story of their family member as high-profile as possible, because again, it was like memorialising the fact that their daughter, their son, their uh, their husband, their wife uh, uh, w was once a living human being and had uh, importance in their lives. So it's back to that sense in which people will consume uh, this kind of material in all kinds of different ways. But what they can't, what the, and therefore what can't be predicted, is that they will be able to have control over that consumption. And it's that lack of control which leads to problems. What you just described there is really close to the behavior that we've seen from the family, from the Murray family. It seems to me like they don't want to give up anything because they see where it could go and that is a pretty dangerous place. Oh, that's absolutely right. It's that sense in which getting an answer, uh, th th they might get an answer, but not the answer they would like. And therefore, they cannot control uh, the, an answer might emerge, which isn't the one they would have chosen when they first started the journey. And ultimately, therefore, that leads to people wanting to shut down 
it mm. leads to people to want to criticize or to scapegoat or to belittle to demean uh, but it ultimately comes back to exactly the same point initially you want the publicity because you think the publicity will give will memorialize or and might lead to a conclusion which is helpful but then when you get the publicity and you realize well wait a minute i can't control what's actually happening here you begin to shut down you begin mm. to think ah uh, there are consequences here which i don't like and there are consequences here which i no longer feel that i can control and i think that's been even more amplified in in newer media spaces so so when you look at some of the studies done of secondary victims and and their interactions with with more traditional media often you find that there's there's somebody there helping them with that whether that's a, a police officer or um you know a, a family friend or somebody who knows you know the media that's not so much there when we look at, at social media. So by kind of putting yourself out there on, on social media, there aren't any of those traditional barriers. So we know that, that the press in this country is, is regulated by a particular authority, you know, as, it, as our television network. So there, there's a degree of protection when, when victims and secondary victims are engaging with the, the mainstream media, which just isn't there with, with social media. And, and they, they can put themselves in quite a vulnerable position by by engaging with with that type of media yeah and i think with the murrays it seems to me that they appreciate the attention that this podcast and other media outlets have given them and and they i think they appreciate the comments like happy birthday mora or you know uh really hope this this is resolved one day uh comments like that on their facebook page i really do think that they deeply appreciate that but in some way they must relive it over and over, and it must uh, take an emotional toll on them. Yeah, because it's, it's that balance, isn't it, between, you know, keeping a, a case in the spotlight and, and not kind of opening a can of worms and, and reopening old wounds, you know, again and again and again. But when you've got a case where it's a missing person and, and there isn't a definitive conclusion... Um, I think there's always going to be, you know, that 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 willingness to 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 invite a few trusted people in who are going to help to to publicize the case. It's very sad because ultimately um, I sometimes feel certainly some of the the families of murder victims that I've spoken with and um, I, I, I've spoken with countless now um, families of murder victims there is a sense in which uh, some of them will turn to the media as a form of therapy. And you do realize at that point that they become a lost soul. And you have to kind of help them realize that the media's agenda isn't as a therapist. The media's agenda isn't telling stories that are going to have purchase with an audience and therefore their intentions, the media's intentions, are quite different from the, inten the uh, intentions of uh, the families who have engaged with the media. And so there's a delicate balance that has to be, um, there has to be an intervention often to say, you know, look, actually, you've got to get help in some other way rather than continuing to tell your story and don't imagine that you're going to be able to control how the story is told. And that's going to be incredibly frustrating. I can see where it's incredibly sad for the relative of a, uh, of a murder victim, but it, I can't even imagine the frustration that it would have for somebody looking for their, for, for their missing daughter or their missing sister um, and knowing that they have to put themselves out there on some level. But not being able to grieve and not like not even having that to you know, that therapeutic outlet, be it good or bad. Some people that I've spoken to in that circumstance, though, have said, you know, well, I'm dealing with this every single day by myself anyway. So um, the idea that some people might want to talk to me who've got similar experiences as a consequence of me talking about it in the media actually provides a form of relief. And, uh, and in, indeed, there is a sense, therefore, 
talking about one missing person draws attention to the phenomenon of people going missing. In this country, they're called mispers. It draws attention to mispers uh, more generically. And the research that I, I was able to do in some of my earlier work draws attention to the fact that 66,000 young people go missing in England and Wales for at least one night every single year. Now, 66,000 might not seem very many in the context of how big the United States is, but when you only have something like 60 million people in England and Wales, that is a huge number of kids that are going to go missing. And thankfully, many of those people will turn up, many of those children will turn up unharmed, but all too often and all too sadly, many of them never turn up, or if they do turn up, they are turned up as uh, somebody who has died as opposed to the living person who disappeared. One question uh, I wanted to ask is, um, have do you think Lance and I have been sensitive or sensitive enough to the Murray family and their situation? Well, I certainly think so. I think you're, t if I may observe, Please, please forgive this kind of um, reflection. Um, uh, I don't know if if you were expecting it, but I, I did think initially there was um, uh, a kind of a negative tone towards the Murray family uh, in the earlier podcasts. And I think actually, as the podcasts have gone on, there has been a much greater willingness to understand and put yourselves, walk in their shoes. And that has become more, much more apparent. Um, and I think there was a Rubicon moment for you when you thought, mm, actually, we've never really spoken to the Murrays. And when you did start to speak to the Murrays, then that allowed that difference in tone to emerge. And I think it was... And partly the, the, the way that the, the media um, in general um, deal with the families of missing people and, and the families of people who are victims of crime, um, they can put their barriers up a bit and be a bit protective. So sometimes it's about finding that gatekeeper who will give you access to the family rather than, you know, approaching them directly. So so it varies from one case to, to the next. But but no, I think you've been incredibly sensitive in, in, in recent episodes and, and having uh, John Smith as that mediator, I think has been a really important part of the process. I think in terms of the the, the, the international example, albeit it's a British example, but it's so well known, it's international now, about how families need the publicity and then worry about their inability to control the publicity is clearly the McCann case about Madeleine McCann who goes missing. And, and of course, has still never been found. And of course, the McCanns were very uh, desperate for media attention uh, just after their daughter had disappeared. And then gradually, as the days and weeks and months and now years have passed, um, they're having to sue um, uh, police officers in Portugal. They're having to get injunctions taken out. Every single person in this country would have a view about the McCanns, and they just simply can't control that process. So the, the, there's that tiger by the tail um, analogy again, that you want the publicity, but ultimately, uh, ultimately you can't control where that publicity might take you. And I, I think for you guys in relation to the Murrays, you're kind of you've kind of recognized that it seemed to me or maybe i'm wrong but i felt there was a recognition that you had to then think well wait a minute there, there's a real family out there who are actually grieving and trying to make sense of what might have happened to this girl that was related to them why don't we ask them about how they're feeling and what they must be thinking about every single day that their daughter, their sister, their loved one hasn't been found. I'm curious about the notion of the armchair detective. And you said the notion of the armchair detective is nothing new. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, I think people have always had an opinion 
about um, particular crimes, particular mysteries, whether they be real or, or fictional. But I think in, in today's society, in, in terms of network media, the, the opportunity to voice that opinion and to connect with others who've got opinions has grown exponentially. So, so I think we, we, we've seen a real kind of um, acceleration of, of this type of thing. So, you know, back in, in the old days before the internet, you know, I'd be watching a crime drama at home with my mum and dad as a teenager, and we'd be speculating about who did it, or there'd be a story on the news about a murder, and, you know, there'd be a press conference on with, with the family, and my dad would go, oh, it's definitely him, he's definitely done it, it's that one there. And, and that was as far as it would go. Um, but now uh, we've got the opportunity to, to voice those opinions and speak to others and and generate theories, you know, collectively. Um, so I think it, it has taken on a whole new life, um, given the, the capacity of, and the affordances of network media. And the oldest, one of the oldest literary genres is, of course, the detective story. If we think about Wilkie Collins, Edgar Allan Poe, and if you think, obviously, um, which is common both to the UK and to the United States, the, the, the continuing interest in Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes. And so that sense in which we consume the detective story, the whodunit, as a way of giving ourselves pleasure, as a way of... Uh, feeling smarter that we've worked out what's been going on before the denouement is presented in the final chapter. Now, of course, what's changed with new media is that um, uh, that, that uh, consumption of the old-fashioned detective story was very private. You know, you consumed it and uh, you read the book, uh, you might have discussed the book, after you had finished it, but effectively it was done privately. What the what new media is doing, what podcasts are doing, is allowing that consumption to be done in association, to be done communally. And therefore that communality allows for different ideas, different hypotheses to be worked through in a much more um, dynamic and uh, uh, immediate way than would ever be done in the way that the old media of the detective story used to be consumed. Wow. I would love to take your class. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to take your class and get an F. You must ask Elizabeth. Elizabeth teaches uh, in the master's program. Elizabeth teaches a, spe a new module all about uh, new media uh, uh, and online crime. And she loves teaching about Maura Murray, uh, the Maura Murray podcast on that. You must ask her a question about that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah we've um yep. yeah the, the the module's called crime online and 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 our master students take it in the the second semester and I always try and kind of make it much more more interesting than the criminology textbooks you know uh, make crime online you know out to be so rather than just looking at things like hacking and phishing and identity theft I look at those questions of of new media and of remediation and, and all of those types of things. And that idea that we live our lives in media is a really important one to, to get to grips with. So so I actually used the, the Maura Murray case and the Maura Murray podcast and the, the subreddit as a topic for, for one of our lectures. So so people are, are really kind of understanding that that continuity between the online and the offline and, and learning that crime and the internet as a topic is about much more than, than hacking and cracking and, and all of those types of things. So what comes of the Maura Murray um, discussion from your classes? Do they, I mean, uh, you know, uh, like our Im email inbox, like do they offer you their theories or is it really just more focused on the uh, result of um, what happens online with this case? 
Well, what they tend to do, first of all, is is just disappear off the radar for a while because <laughs> they go and catch up on all the podcasts and, you know, don't emerge from, from their houses until they've listened to everything. But then they, they come back to, to uni with a real passion and an enthusiasm to talk about some of the issues that, that the podcast throws up. So it brings up some real kind of traditional criminological theory, you know, the, this idea of um, the theory of the missing white girl syndrome and, and all of this, this type of stuff and, uh, and and how we we make sense of, of women's deviant and criminal behavior but also they've got that that new edge on it now in that they're looking at it through the eyes of, of, of criminology students who understand new media um so so they they're just they've just got a real passion to to find out more about it what is the uh, missing white girl syndrome well, this is the idea that that essentially, when we look at, at cases of missing people, that there are a particular a, a particular group of cases that are going to get much more media attention than than other cases, and this has been borne out by quite a lot of research uh, as well. So, when you have, um, especially when we look at children, so so children. Who, who go missing if they're white, if they're girls, if they've got blonde hair and blue eyes, then then that makes them incredibly newsworthy. But if we look at children from disadvantaged backgrounds um, who come from, you know, broken homes, whose parents are, are substance abusers and those types of things, those kids don't get anywhere near the the amount of, of attention that the 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 the, the, the kind of worthier you know, in, in inverted commas quote uh, cases do. And this goes back to a criminological idea um, of the ideal victim. So so this was um, was announced by a criminologist back in the 1980s called Niels Christie. And he said the ideal victim is somebody who, when hit by crime, is most readily accorded the status of the victim because they're seen as vulnerable, uh, as worthy of our sympathy because they're completely innocent um, they're not to blame at all for, for for being victims, for finding themselves as victims. And we, we found this in, in this country, the, the case of Steve Wright, who, who murdered several sex workers in, in Ipswich um, a few years ago. Um, there were all of the, the discussion around them was describing them as sex workers, you know, and, and they, they weren't seen, you know, as as mothers, as sisters, as as people with, you know, ambitions and, and those types of things. So there's the, I think the, the, the mainstream media has got, you know, this idea of what's newsworthy, you know, what victims are going to be appealing to our audiences, what victims do people really not care less about? And therefore, the kinds of people who will go missing, who won't appear in podcasts, who won't appear on the front pages of regional, local or indeed national papers, will be men and will be black men uh, and working class black men in particular. So this idea of there being an ideal victim um, uh, that uh, news editors will prioritise in terms of the kinds of stories that they will pick. I was suggesting earlier to you that 66,000 young people in England and Wales will go missing each particular year in this country. But news editors will choose one of those 66,000 young people that go missing to make a story out of. And the story and, and that one person or a handful of people will be tend to be, as Elizabeth said, idealized white children who are girls who have blonde hair and blue eyes. And so the missing white woman syndrome that we've been talking about fits entirely in terms of the publicity that's given to Maura Murray, but not given to some of the black girls of a similar age who have been missing for the same length of time and who went, went missing at the same time as Maura Murray. Yeah, that's fascinating. And uh, and I'm sure that's absolutely true in media. Um, certainly wasn't the reason we got involved in this uh, case, but maybe it's it certainly contributes to the reason that it, it is so popular. I was actually just going to say, we're saying it's not the reason we got involved in this case, but the reason I got involved in this case was because her picture popped up uh, while I was looking for, you know, just... It was fulfilling my my true crime. Uh, her and picture. therefore, there was a limited number of pictures that could have popped up because there were only, there would only be a limited number of pictures that news editors felt were going to create what's called proximity between 
uh, that news story and those people, those audiences that that news story was aimed at. And increasingly, those those pictures would be uh, those would be of 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 white uh, girls as opposed to black girls. They'd be of girls as opposed to boys. They'd be of middle class people as opposed to working class people. They would be of people who came from um, uh, established or traditional family backgrounds as opposed to people who came from much more fluid family backgrounds. Yeah, and pretty rapidly, once you get into the case, you realize all of the. Um all the oddities and all the eccentric things that, that surround the case and the characters in the case and, you know, the, the area in New Hampshire where she disappeared. So that, that, that takes over at, at very quickly. That'll, that takes over, but just getting involved in it. Yeah, it is that, it is that, that, uh, you know, that, that picture of the young, young white woman that that's right there. And then once you start reading about it, that's what starts your interest. It just, it, just one thing that you you just said about the area there just just got me thinking about another area of criminology that's that's become quite interesting in recent years is is this idea of dark tourism so people wanting to go to places where where people have disappeared from where people have been murdered where you know horrendous crimes have have happened uh, there is a kind of real little leisure industry that's developing around particular cases especially in relation to to serial killers and, and that type of thing and I'd be interested to to hear your views about some of the the residents up there in in New Hampshire in terms of you know how they they feel have they noticed a, an increase in in the number of people visiting the site and knocking on their doors and and that kind of thing really oh yeah they hate it um, the the people up there near the the accident site where Mora uh, disappeared um, the Westmans and uh, some other people uh, well really maybe I'm speaking more of the Westmans more than anyone because I, I don't know if I can directly speak about anyone else but they don't. They really don't appreciate it at all. Well, the owners of the Swiftwater Stage Shop as well. Uh-huh. You really shouldn't go in there and ask about. You know, hey, I'm looking into the Moore Murray case. Right. Uh, you get chased um, out bridges, with a bat. Bridges have been burned. Up there. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah. Elizabeth mentioned the Ipswich case uh, in her previous answer, and I, I was working on the Ipswich case. This was a case in 2006 in uh, Suffolk in England when um, a a number of young women uh, were murdered by somebody called Steve Wright and those women were um, sex workers and I remember I was standing uh, beside uh, the police do not cross tape and I saw a bus arrive and um, I thought it was um, and people got off the it was a minibus and people got out of the minibus and I thought it must be the family of the girl whose body had just been found. And I thought I should go up and introduce myself um, because, you know, I'd clearly been um, uh, involved in, in trying to work out what was happening. And as I went up and I, I put out my hand to shake it to the first person that got off the bus, the man <laughs> waved my hand away and said, oh, don't worry about me. We saw it on the news and we just wanted to come down and look for ourselves. And that takes took me completely back into seltzer and wound culture and feeling people feeling that they needed to become connected to uh, sites of trauma. And that dark tourism is another area that seems to me that criminology hasn't yet grasped and hasn't yet wanted to talk about. That's really interesting. Um, as you're saying that, it, I I uh, thought back to the first time I was in uh, Los Angeles and I took one of those star tours. I don't know why, but the only two things I remember from it right now is driving by Jack Nicholson's house and uh, driving by the O.J. Simpson house. Uh, and I and everyone was fascinated by that. And they were. I think there's still tours that go around that area, even though the house doesn't exist anymore. And I wonder how many of uh, uh, how many of the people listening to the podcast have gone on uh, the San Quentin tour, um, you know, visiting prisons. You know, wh- why do we want to turn prisons into um, experiences where um, tourists will buy to be 
uh, shown round the jail by an ex-inmate. It's a, a, a very strange phenomenon that we're beginning to identify these sites of of trauma as places that we will uh, consume and enjoy in other ways. As both of you uh, experience the, the, the case, the, the Moore Murray case, as you listen to the podcast and read the, all the material, have either of you thought to yourself that this is something from a criminologist's standpoint, this is something that is solvable? Well, I think, yes. <laughs> yeah, these cases are always, always solvable um, because it, it's like we say, somebody always knows something. And, and the way that, that a lot of cold cases actually get solved is is often not through DNA, not through forensic evidence, but but through people's loyalties changing and people's relationships changing and, and people who were protecting somebody at a particular point in time, that that relationship may have changed 10 years later, 15 years later. So I think the key is always people and their relationships, you know, rather than, than anything else. And, and that can take quite a long time to, to unravel and, and, and for things to come loose. Liz, you said something about after a period of time, someone knows some something relationships might deteriorate and somebody is more willing to talk and I that that stood out to me because I know that people like John Smith and other investigators who have been with the family and have been investigating the case since the beginning have moments of extreme frustration because it affects their lives it affects their jobs it, it ultimately affects everything going on around them and they they feel like after 12 years they've gotten nowhere and when you said that it almost sounded like a moment of optimism where maybe this is a good time to just keep pushing a little bit harder to talk to people because maybe those those relationships are starting to deteriorate and maybe some people want to talk yeah, I think when when a case is, you know, as as John Smith is is always saying, brought back into the light, people can't, you know, be in denial for 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 very much longer. Because um, I think when when a case doesn't get very much coverage, it becomes forgotten about, it becomes swept under the carpet. It's much easier for people who do know something about it to to get on with their lives and and not say anything. But but when people are being constantly reminded of it. You know, because it's it, it's it's in the media again because it's high profile. I think maybe that is the point at, at which something can be can be shaken loose in in cases like these. And there's there's cases that, that we have of, of missing people in in the UK where you see appeals, you know, ten years after, fifteen years after, and, and actually it's at that point when when something does does come away and 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 the, the can of worms is is opened up. That's a, a very clever answer that Elizabeth has given and it's based on both our theoretic work and our applied work. But I wonder, were you hinting at in your question, do we, uh, which, do we have a view about what might happen, have happened tomorrow, Murray? That was my next question. <laughs> and I, I, think you, I think you're giving me too much credit. <laughs> do you, David and Liz, have a theory on what happened to Maura? Um, you know, coming from your very interesting uh, criminal criminologist background wow this i think i think for me i think all of the options are still on the table um because we we haven't been able to definitively exclude you know one or, or another you know theory so so i think and, and the the fact that it is an ongoing investigation as well and and i've, I've listened to, to the most recent podcast and the amount of information that law enforcement is willing to give out is always quite limited and, and quite you know well screened so if you haven't got access to it to all of that information then then you're going to be incredibly constrained in what in where where you come down in, in any particular camp i tend to be the more Presbyterian between Elizabeth and myself, and I, I tend uh, to therefore always, uh, I, I think she's dead. I think if she was still alive, we would have found uh, some evidence of her living, whether that be living under an assumed identity or otherwise. So my, my own sense is that she's dead. Um, I, whether she um, was abducted or took her own life, I I, I veer towards taking her own life. Um, I, I've worked on cases where um, somebody could be abducted very, very quickly and um, 
uh, and that abduction, uh, you, you know, pops out of the blue. So I'm aware that abduction can happen uh, on the spur of the moment, by chance, um, unbelievably so. Uh, but I, I don't get the sense that um, she was abducted at all. I think that her life was unraveling in a very, uh, in very um, extreme ways, very quickly. And I think she intended to take her own life. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that's always confused me is that I never understood from the podcasts or from things I've then subsequently read uh, is the investigation into trying to find her after the car had crashed. And I know that when you and I, Lance, Tim, made email contact, um, you both pointed out to me that there were no footprints but I, 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 in the close vicinity that uh, police were able to track. But I, I would presume that um, she found uh, some way um, and died. Um, and uh, again, when people say to me, well, then surely her body would have been found by now. Again, I've worked on um, cases whereby um, bodies um, often get lost. Uh, We are a very small piece of humanity in a very large world, and often bodies are not found for year after year after year.